This morning's reading is taken from 2 Timothy 3, verses 14 through to the end, and 2 Timothy 4, verses 1 through to 5. It can be found on the Church Bible if you wish to follow it on page 1197. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have <clears throat> become convinced of, because you know those from whom you have learned it, and how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting and training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in the view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when men will not put up with sound, sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires. They will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. But you, keep your head in all situations, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, discharge all the duties of your ministry. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Stephen Brendan. Uh, Tim would like to come up. Um, we're just going to pray for the children as well before we pray for Tim. So, Father, we just bring to you um, the children of our church this morning. Thank you, Lord, uh, that we have the opportunity to be teaching them and uh, for them to have their groups. We do pray, Lord, for the leaders, praying that each one, the leaders and the children, would be blessed this morning as they look at your word and, and have fun together. Amen. Father, we just pray for Tim now. Lord, thank you for the preparation that he's done. Thank you for the way you've been speaking to him. And Lord, just pray that you take what he says, Lord, what you say through him this morning, and that you minister to our hearts and we go away, Lord, um, changed um, this morning. Just pray, Lord, for your Holy Spirit's anointing on him, Lord, and on our hearts. Amen. Thanks, Josh. <laughs> Worried it wasn't going to work then. Well, I guess any of you who have children, whether your own or you know, nieces, nephews, or your um, you know, brothers and sisters when you were young, we all know that children grow really, really quickly, don't we? I remember holding my niece when she was a few hours old in my arms and thinking just how small she was. She's about nine now and has a voice of her own, and she makes it known that we can hear her. I've seen her grow up from the times when she depended on her mum and dad, and sometimes grandma, granddad, and Uncle Tim, for everything, from feeding to changing the nappy to you know, any little thing, making sure she had her, her milk, through to now, where she's much more independent. You know, She goes to school, she does her homework, she can read on her own, all of that, we've seen her as she's grown up. Of course, we teach children, don't we, more and more, and then they go to school and they learn more and more. And as we all know, sitting here, our learning doesn't stop when we've left school. But we build up that bank of knowledge. And it's often childhood can be referred to as the formative years, isn't it? Well, thinking about my niece, Amanda and I last year met, uh, met my sister and brother-in-law with my niece, in Skipton, which is a town that's about 40 minutes away from us um, up in Yorkshire. And we were t as we were walking around, we were talking about our faith. And my sister was telling me how Zoe, my niece, used to love hearing the Bible stories when she was going to bed. 
you'd have a children's Bible, you know, the one with like the, the, the stories and all the pictures. And they used to read the Bible stories to her every night. Well, it got to the point where my niece said, Mum, I want a proper Bible. I want a proper Bible like yours. Obviously, she was meaning one like these. Now, I know that the children's Bible are, of course, proper Bibles, you know, but she wanted one with all the text in like her mum's got so that she could carry on reading and learning. As we were in Skipton, we had to go to the Christian bookshop and they knew me very well. I can't for one reason think why, but they knew us really well. And we went in and we were having a look and my niece saw this Bible that she really liked. Now, it, was, it wasn't read, it had the sort of children's pictures on it, it was still a children's Bible, but it had much more text in it. And she was like, I really want that Bible. And Amanda and I felt we, we were, we were going to buy that Bible for her, so we bought that Bible for her. For the rest of the day, as we walked around Skipton, she clutched it really tightly here. And as she walked around, it was market day, so Skipton was really, really busy. As she was going up to people, she was just going up to random people going, look at my Bible, look at my Bible, this is my Bible. <laughs> she still reads her Bible regularly and knows it. As she did that, of course, people were like, wow, that's great. You know, I acknowledge the child. Others were like, well, pff, I don't want to know about that. And of course, there were ones that were just going, that's fantastic. I wish I did that. I wonder how many of us are that proud of our Bibles Obviously, Zoe was proud of it on that moment because it was her new thing. But how many of us are really proud of our Bible, proud of Scripture, proud of the Word of God? Of course, in this day and age, there's lots of different ways of reading the Bible. We don't just have to read from the book. For some of us, including me, we perhaps turn our Bibles on. because I've got it on my phone. For some of us, and like Amanda, I know as she goes to work, she has it on CD. And she listens to David Suchet read the Bible to her. And I'm, she tells me on good authority that she's actually been through the whole Bible twice now. And because she does that, it's because it's not reading, she can, she's picked up other things. And she challenges me on my knowledge sometimes. But she's picked different things up because it's a different way of exploring God's word. Well, of course, our reading this morning comes from 2 Timothy. If you remember a couple of weeks ago, we looked at an earlier part of 2 Timothy, and we looked about rekindling the gifts that God has given us, and then about not being ashamed of the Bible. For those of you here last week, Dean looked at 2 Peter and how we live a godly life. Well, today, I think this reading actually follows on quite nicely from those two, and I'll be honest, this is the lectionary reading, and I hadn't realized when, I, when we said, well, let's just do that reading, just how well it would actually fit in with, this, with what we've been talking about recently. So I want to actually look at the Word of God and evangelism. Now before you all squirm in your seats, I'm not going to say to you, you all need to go and stand up and preach the, new, preach the good news at the top of your voice in Luton. That's, it's a loaded term as evangelism, and I want to look at what it means for each and every one of us. But in some ways, this letter, this, the, the whole letter of 2 Timothy, in particular the passage we had today, I really like that, I really like it. Because as a human being, we know that we can't survive without bread or water. It's an essential part of our lives. Well, as a Christian, the essential part of our lives is the Word of God. It's Scripture. And I think that's the message that Paul's trying to get across to us. And I wonder, I'm not going to ask you for an answer, but how well do, you, do we all know our Bibles? Do we know it inside out, back to front? Now, I ask that question because at the moment in our world, there's lots of people who don't know the Bible. There's lots of people who might say that they're a Christian, but are actually biblically illiterate. In this day and age that we're living in, people just don't know the basic Bible stories. And friends, that's got to change. I believe that has to change. Gone are the days where everybody growing up would go to Sunday school and, re and know the Jesus stories. I, want, I don't know whether we'll get back to that. It may not be that God wants us back at that point, but I do believe that God wants us to start talking about the Bible to people, to tell people the biblical stories. Because there's lots of people that 
will say things and don't realize they're actually from the Bible. So we're, in, we're living in an age where people don't know their Bible. And that's why I think this is really important. Now, I saw this at uh, one of my churches when I was uh, training as an ordinand. They had a poster up and it said, you are the only Bible someone may read. So let me ask you this morning, do the way, does the way that you live your life reflect the word of God? Now I don't mean we all, we see this, we all walk around holding our Bibles, telling people. I don't mean that. I mean when people look at you and your lifestyle, do they know that you're a Christian? Do they know that you believe? People will look at the way we behave. And I'm afraid to say they will judge us on that. So is the life that we're living reflecting the word of God? Because for some, the way we react to a situation may be that only glimpse of the Bible they get. And it may be that that little glimpse will then encourage them to start reading a bit more. Now, of course, for us to be able to do this, to be the Bible that people will read. We need to know the, Bibles ourselves, the Bible ourselves. And that means spending time studying the Word. Now, I don't want to make you feel guilty this morning if you're not reading your Bible every day. We all go through seasons where we're avidly picking it up. As soon as we get up in the morning, we pick our Bible up, we read the passage, we pray, and we go out in our day and feel great. But I know, I'm just the same. We all have those seasons where it's really, really hard to even sit down and open the Bible. We have those seasons. I think that's partly what Paul's getting at when he says, in season and out of season. That there are times in our lives when it just flows. When we really want to know, well, what comes next? You know, when you get to the end of the reading for that reading for that day, and you think, but I want to know what happens next. But there's also those times when we sit at home and think, do you know what? I really don't feel like reading the Bible today. I think it was really um, appropriate way when Helen got her, that word this morning just about feeling on empty. Because sometimes we can feel completely empty and drained. Funny enough, I know those of you that were at Wednesday Church a week and a half ago, I talked a little bit about using that car analogy and how when we go on a journey, we prepare our cars for the journey we make sure we've got the fuel because we don't know that as we turn around the corner we may hit that traffic. But do we do the same for our spiritual lives? Do we prepare for the journey ahead of us? Do we spend time with God? Do we read his word? Of course, in the reading, Paul tells Timothy that since infancy he's known the Holy Scriptures. Timothy grew up knowing the Scriptures and that was able to make him wise. We also become wise as we read the scriptures. We learn more about God. I once heard somebody say, um, to, in response to a question, the question, well, I've stopped hearing God speak to me. The reply was, well, why have you stopped reading your Bible? So perhaps if you're feeling that God's not speaking to you at the moment, I want to ask you that question. Are you spending enough time reading the Bible reading the word of God. We often find that as we read scripture, as we read different passages, maybe ones we've read before, that something different jumps out at us and we notice it. Well, that's God speaking to us through his word. I don't know if you've heard of the practice of Lectio Divina. Now, I'll be honest. When I first heard that term, I was very suspicious of it because I thought, well, it's Latin, it must be Catholic. But how wrong was I? I was, and I admit, I was wrong. Because actually, that's proved to be a really useful tool for me. The idea behind Lectio Divina, you may have come across it, so bear with me if you have. But you, read, you take a passage of Scripture. You read through it a few times. Maybe in a different translation each time. Maybe the same translation. You ask, well, what, well, you, of course, you pray beforehand, and then you read it. Got that slightly wrong around. There's prayer at the, first, at the start as well. Ask God, well, what do you want me to know from this passage? Read it through a few times. We'll see, the next question is, what jumps out at you? Maybe it's a word, a phrase, a verse. 
But what jumps out at you? And then spend a bit of time just pondering that and praying about it and asking God, what does that mean? If you haven't tried it yet, then I encourage you, give it a go. You've nothing to lose. It might not work for you, but if it does, great. You all have your own ways of studying Scripture. So why do I share all this about Scripture and spending time in the Word? Well, the answer comes in our reading. All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the people of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. All of our Bible is God-breathed. It is his word to us. And we know that the Bible is the word of God. We also know that there are probably parts that we don't like, that we find difficult. It's still God's word to us. We can't go about changing things, changing the word of God to suit ourselves. To think, well, actually, I believe this. The Bible says that, but I believe this, so I'm going to change it to say this. We just can't do that. Because in, a, in the world where Christianity is being pushed out at every single corner, we have to stand true to the Bible, to biblical truths. We have to make a stand for it. And it might make us unpopular, but it's something that I believe we're called to do. As we look at the news, we listen to the media, we see things that are happening in the world, and you think, but... They say they're Christian, but it's not representing what we know the Bible to be. We have to make a stand. As Paul says, there'll come a time when people won't listen to sound doctrine. I'm not standing here to say that we're all sound. You know, I don't want to think that we've all got big heads. I hope we are, but, you know, we might not be. But there is a time, I think that time has come where people in the church are trying to distort scripture to make it match what they believe. And that can't happen. It's the word of God. It's inspired by God. God breathed his word. He spoke his word. And we have to listen to the spirit to allow us to interpret that. We can't change it for our own desires. Because I don't believe that the spirit will ever get us to interpret scripture in a way that deviates us from doctrine and what we actually believe. But it does sound like people are turning away from the truth. They're turning towards myths because it's nice to hear. So I wonder, have we watered down the gospel? Have we watered down what God is saying to the world? course, as it says, scripture can be used for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. Paul doesn't tell us to change things, to respond to what's happening in the world, but Paul is reminding Timothy and reminding us that we've faithfully followed the gospel to now, and we're being charged to continue to do so as we carry on our journeys. We can challenge and charge to continue studying scripture, to continue learning scripture, to continue preaching sound doctrine, and to continue speaking the truth. It's when we hear things that take us away from scripture. As I say, we need to take that stand. We need to remind people what scripture actually says. That's part of the the teaching. Because as we spend time with God's word, it changes us and it transforms us. It gives us true information about how our own lives can be transformed. So we can use to teach scripture for that, for teaching each other. It can also be used for rebuke. As we study, we find that the Bible will inform us when we've been doing something that's out of line with God's will. You know what I'm talking about. As you read and you think, yeah, okay, Lord, you've got me there. And we repent. We say sorry to God and we change the way we act. Sometimes that's obvious when we read scripture. Sometimes it's blatantly obvious right there, you know. Other times it's as you read and the spirit just prompts you inside. You say, actually, you're not quite right there. 
But that's why it's important to spend time with God's word. It may be, in rebuking, we need to call one another out on that. It may be that actually we need to say, well, I'm not quite sure that you're living according to God's will. Obviously, we've got to do that sensitively. But it should be done in a way, not to make people feel bad, but showing that the Bible can improve us as we are trained in righteousness. If we change those bad habits, we can then become more righteous. We can be trained in righteousness, as Paul says. Because Scripture helps us to become more like Jesus and to live our complete lives as human beings, as God intended. So as we do this, as we spend time reflecting on that, we then reflect God more. And then as we're out in the world, we can show God to more people as people read us as a Bible. Paul carries on at the start of chapter 4 by giving us a charge, as I say, to preach the word, keep our head in all situations, to do the work of an evangelist, amongst other things. Now that's a charge for each and every one of us. It's not for us all to stand on platforms. I haven't got the slides in the wrong way around. It's not for us all to stand on platforms and share, you know, and share our faith and encourage people by making altar calls. It can just be simply sat with somebody, having a coffee, and sharing with them your faith. It can be simply inviting somebody to church. It's a charge to share our faith with those around us, to tell people the truth, and not get sucked into what the world wants us to think. There are so many people in the world who are lost and searching for answers we are the ones that can give them those answers. We can't take our lead from the prevailing fashions of the day, but we take our lead from God. Last week, Dean, Ellie, and I were at an evangelism summit in Birmingham called Advance 2020. It's something that came out of the Message Trust in Manchester with a view to spreading the word of God across the nation in 2020. Those leading the movement believe that we're in a place where people are willing to listen to us about faith. After all, our country is at a crossroads. We're at a very crucial time. And it's often in those critical times when people start searching for answers. People are lost and they don't know what to do. So you may be sat there thinking, well, people don't want to hear about my faith. Well, I want to give you some stats. And these are all from the HOPE website, so you can verify them yourselves. 67% of people in our nation know a practicing Christian. So over two-thirds of the population know a practicing Christian. A practicing Christian is defined as somebody who studies scripture, prays at least once a week, and goes to church at least once a month. Lots of people know us. Are we sharing our faith with them? People were asked, what are the three main things people think when you mention, when they think of being a Christian? I wonder what three words do you think? If, I was to, if you were to ask somebody on the street and say to them, what do you think a Christian is? Do you think they'd come up with good words? Do you think they'd be bad words? Boring, Boring hypocrite, self-righteous. self-righteous. Do you want to know what they really said? That we're friendly, caring, and good-humored. Those are the top three things that people think of when they think of a Christian. 60% of adults also believe Jesus was a real person. Now, I'll be honest, that one surprised me because our historical evidence now proves that it's actually that Jesus is, it was a real person. And even atheist scholars of the time of Jesus will now say that Jesus was a real person. That's what the historical evidence shows. So I'm surprised that one wasn't higher, but hey. 21% of adults say that Jesus is God in human form. 43% of adults believe in the resurrection. And 66% of people who were in this survey had talked about Jesus in the last month to friends or family or a non-Christian. 
So I think that these stats are incredibly exciting. If we listen to the media, we're inclined to believe that no one wants us to talk about Jesus, that if we talk about it, you know, we're not going to get anywhere, that people don't believe Jesus existed, that they don't believe in the resurrection. Well, friends, these show different. These figures show different. So I hope that that encourages you. It really encouraged the three of us last week. I think actually, people want to know about Jesus. So when Paul says to Timothy, do the work of an evangelist, as I say, he's not saying we have to stand up and shout on the corner of the streets like this, like Homer Simpson, or, you know, we don't have to shout and shout about, because actually, again, the stats show that things like this tend not to work. There's a really interesting film out, I can't remember where it's from, it's it's American, called Father of Lights. And it it interviews somebody who does this, and he says, well, how many people have you seen come to faith? in a year. It's fantastic. I've seen five people come to faith. They then interview another group of people. People like street pastors. People like those who do healing on the streets, or the American equivalent. People who show love, compassion. And they say to them, well, how many people have you seen come to faith? And they say, we stopped counting at 500. This is not what we're called to do. We're called to live out our faith. We're called to be, to love each other. Not just those in our church, but to love our neighbors outside. To love our enemies. We're called to share the good news of Jesus Christ. So I wonder, this week, if I can ask you now, when was the last time you shared your faith with somebody? When was the last time you sat down and talked about Jesus? In whatever way. Don't feel guilty if you haven't done it for a long time. I don't want anybody to leave here feeling guilty. But what I want to say to you is pray for opportunities to share your faith. They can come in so many different ways. The stories we heard last week at Advance of people praying and the opportunities that came up were fantastic. They can sometimes come when we're least expecting them. One story somebody shared was he'd prayed for an opportunity, he got on the train home, he was tired, he got his Bible out and opened it, and somebody started asking him about the Bible, and he was really grumpy and didn't want to engage. And then he realized, hang on, this is my opportunity to share my faith. So pray for those opportunities. Pray for one another for those opportunities to share your faith. I know it's not always easy, but I encourage you to try We can't wait for the perfect time to share our faith because it might just come too late. And we all know that we often get shy when we do it. I do as well. I miss opportunities. But we don't. We need to see it not as a duty about ourselves, but it's about what God is wanting us to do. It's about taking great patience and careful instruction, as Paul tells us. It's about loving people, showing compassion, And show them what it means to have a living relationship with the Lord. Now I was looking for a clip to show you. Because there's a few films that Amanda and I have got. And there's a really good clip about doing just this. But it would have taken far too much time to actually explain the story. So I probably need to show you the film at some point. But as I was looking for this, I came across a video from the Episcopal Diocese of Texas. I will tell you, I did actually steal this. Um, Well, I got it from YouTube. But I think it captures the essence of what we've been talking about and why we need to tell others about Jesus. So I'm hoping the video is going to play. But just see what, see what you think of this.
I think that summarizes it perfectly, really. Why we need to do it and the way we do it. I think one of my favorite quotes on that video was, it's one beggar showing another beggar where to find bread. When it's put like that, it doesn't seem as scary, does it? When we looked at that earlier part of 2 Timothy a couple of weeks ago, about not being ashamed, what was stopping us from sharing the gospel? In many ways, I think this part of 2 Timothy encourages us to live out the gospel. It's all well and good if we go out speaking about Jesus, sharing him with our friends. But what if our own life doesn't match the gospel life? A recent study looked at well-known names. The first was Apple. The second was McDonald's. Jesus came third. Surely something's wrong there. Jesus should be first. If I was to say to you now, turn to your neighbor and tell them about why you like your mobile phone in your pocket, the brand, I'm sure there'd be a buzz. Or what you, you know, why you like going to Tesco's over Asda. There'd be a buzz. But if I was to say to you, turn to your neighbor and talk about Jesus, I'd hope in this room there was a buzz. But how would that look when you meet your neighbor as you go home today? Do you tell them you've been at church? Do you tell them about Jesus in your own way? There's no right or wrong way of doing this. And I want to share a picture of you yesterday when we, were, when we met um, for MLT as we were praying. I had a picture of us all standing at the church doors and the community surrounding our building but not stepping over onto the, onto the, uh, the path out there. And I just got a sense of God saying, it's up to us to say, come on in. You're welcome here. Come on in. You're welcome. So I share that with you in a hope that it brings encouragement. People are open to hearing about Jesus. Are we willing to talk to them about him? Because if those numbers are true, which I, they are, why are we not having more people in church? Is it because we're not living out the gospel as well as we could? Now, of course, we all slip up. But are we walking the walk? We talk. Just gotten to give a couple of examples of that as I come to a close. You may remember the entertainer a couple of years ago. There's a Christian, Christian run business. The, the uh, CEO is a Christian. A couple of years ago, Christmas Eve fell on a Sunday. And all the experts were saying it would be the biggest or the second biggest day in the run-up to Christmas. But the CEO of the entertainer stuck to what he believed in. And he didn't open on Christmas Eve because it was a Sunday. That's walking the walk. That's respecting the Sabbath. That's not bowing down to pressures of the commercial world, or pressures of consumer culture, pressures of the world. Now, as far as I remember, it didn't actually affect the sales figures that much. But the owner said, we don't trade on Sundays, any Sundays. Keeping the Sabbath holy is one of the Ten Commandments. We'll be closed for the second largest trading day of the year. As a Christian, I believe in families. You may remember if you went in, they had little signs up saying, we're closed Christmas Eve because we want our staff to spend time with their families. Somebody said, well, well even with Christmas Eve being a Sunday, you're still closed? To which Mr. Grant replied, what's the difference? The principle is a day of rest. That's walking the walk as well as talking the talk. So how are we walking the walk? Are we being a Bible that people can read? Are we showing people that we believe in our actions and in our words? And another quote I came across, you may have heard of the band DC Talk who were around in the 90s, and this quote is at the start of one of their songs. The greatest single cause of atheism in the world today is Christians who acknowledge Jesus with their lips, walk out the door, and deny him by their lifestyle. That is what an unbelieving world simply finds unbelievable. It's quite a powerful comment. And I first heard that in a song, I was like really struck by that. And it made me really think, well, does my lifestyle reflect Jesus? Does my lifestyle reflect what we're taught? I kind of encourage you, let's not be those people who acknowledge Jesus with our lips and walk out the door and not acknowledge him in our lifestyle. There's enough fake news out there. There's enough false prophets. There's enough false doctrine in the world 
Let's not add to that. Let's be people who can speak truth, who can speak life, and who can live like Jesus taught us to be. It's not going to be easy. There'll be times when we feel tested, when we feel pulled away from a lifestyle that reflects Jesus. There'll be times when we feel utterly drained. But as we start to turn our attention towards the latter part of 2019, there become so many opportunities to invite people to something. We've got Remembrance Day coming up. And in memory service, we've got Christingle, carol service, midnight, Christmas Day. It's such a good opportunity to say to your neighbor, would you like to come to church with me? What's the worst they can do? Say no. In our country at the moment, there's such a lot of despondency, anger, and division. You could almost say that there's chaos in our country. What does the Bible say about chaos? It's back in Genesis 1. God brings order out of chaos. Advance 2020 believe that next year is going to be a big year for evangelism across the nation. Something has to shift in our country. Our churches should be places of healing for all those people who are struggling. All those people who feel they don't know where to turn. There should be a place of healing not just for ourselves, but for all our communities across the land. We just need to be ready to invite them in. So I want to spend a few moments in prayer, thinking, take the time to reflect with God. Well, is my, does my lifestyle reflect the Bible? Do people see Jesus in me as I walk around? Who can I invite to church? Who can I talk to my faith about this week? Maybe there's a part of your life that you feel God saying to you, I need to leave that at the foot of the cross. I encourage you to do that this morning. If there's something that's not quite right, leave it at the foot of the cross. Maybe God's given you a picture of a person who you know is that the person you're called to speak to about your faith? You'll know the right, the right way to do it. Pray for the opportunity that God would open that door to allow you to share with that person. Maybe you've stopped opening your Bible every day. You find it too difficult to just open the cover. Ask God to help you carve out time for him. Because when you carve out time for God, everything else in life seems to fall into place so much better. Ask God to help you walk the walk as you leave this place today. you show love and compassion to this afternoon.
Amen.